Hello, and welcome to the PTA Global Co-Founder Webinar Series. And this is a big one. This is a big one. We have Bobby Capuccio, the man, the myth, online, ready to share, ready to get to know all of you and for all of you to get to know him a little bit better. Uh, thank you for joining us, Bobby. Thanks for having me, Dan. And thank you, everybody who's listening to this right now. So I'm just going to go through few quick housekeeping items in case it's your first webinar with us. You're all muted by default, but you have a panel that says questions on your control panel, a little, a little uh, box there. Please type all your questions and comments in that box throughout the webinar. I'll be screening it when you see me look off camera. It's because I'm looking at the question panel. Uh, we're very anxious to get those questions. Uh, <laughs> Rodney Korn is on and he says, love the beard, BC. So. Uh, Apparently the camera is working, that's a good thing. So do put your questions in the question panel. We're gonna run 25 minutes or so and then start uh, fielding questions. So make sure you type them in there. There are some downloads that we encourage you to download. It says handouts, go ahead and do that. And there will be no exam for this webinar. It's not a CEC course, there's no exam. That's the good news, just tune in and uh, you know enjoy your time with us as much as we enjoy our time with you. So without further ado, uh, welcome, Bobby. And Bobby, what, what I would absolutely love is if, if you could just uh, share a, a bit of a bio about your trajectory and your career in the industry uh, from, from the beginning to what you're doing now. Oh, wow. Okay. So when I was 18 years old, I had the crazy idea that maybe I should get certified as a trainer. And I got, I got to fitness for different reasons than a lot of people get into fitness. I got into fitness because... Um, I had certain issues with more learning and development. Um, I have Tourette's and um, by the time I started exercising, I had quite a bit of brain damage. Um, some of that was um, congenital and some of that was from uh, multiple concussions and blunt force trauma. I was also um, physically deformed. I was disfigured in my face. And you know, it, it's weird because when I say that and people see my face now, they're like, there's no way that you looked worse than you do now, but I did. And so I got into training because I was trying to create a cocoon and focus on something single-mindedly where I could avoid interaction. And what happened from that is I discovered that if you can get good at something and something becomes sacred to you, I stumbled upon what I didn't know at the time was an originating intention, which is something that is so valuable so sacred and so enriching to your life that you start to want it for everybody else around you without condition. And, and it's almost like, how do you choose your career versus your calling? And a career is you know, merely what you're paid for, but a calling is what you're made for. It's something that you cannot not engage in because it pursues you. And that's what started to happen. So I was 18 years old. I thought, if I could just give some of what fitness has given to me to other people, I think that would be not only in you Neil know, Spruce's words, a great way to make a living, but also to simultaneously make a difference. So I got certified and my very first job uh, got fired really quickly because I was, I was going to college and my last professor loved to keep the class late. And, and it was a, a short time crunch to get to work anyway. So I was constantly coming in late, got fired, and then I, I went from Manhattan into Brooklyn, walked through the front doors at Gold's Gym, got the job, and I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of stuff that happened, but I met my first mentor, a guy by the name of Mitch Pacifica, and the lesson that Mitch Pacifica, do, do you mind if I, if I talk about the lessons I learned in my trajectory? Because I think- Of course not. Out. Mitch was the one who taught me to hold the space for someone, my belief is greater than your doubt. And I think that's one of the preeminent tenets of coaching and what makes a great coach is the willingness and the authenticity to hold and believe in that space between you and whoever else, your client, your audience. And Mitch held that space for me and he was my guide. I, I had ambitions, but I didn't have clarity. I had a lot of enthusiasm, but I didn't have a lot of direction. I was kind of like an octopus on rollerblades, if you can imagine that. <laughs> a lot of motion, no direction whatsoever. 
And he was the person like all great guides do who allowed me to just have the, the safety and the encouragement to go as far as I could see. Because once you get there, what happens? You're able to see further. After I left Gold Gym, I met somebody else who was critical in my journey, a guy by the name of David Barton. And David Barton had an extremely upscale health club chain. And it was different than a Gold's Gym in every possible way. So I, I was in a completely different environment. And the one thing I did well in that environment is I had the wherewithal to sit in front of someone who was a lot smarter than me and who was very specific on what his brand was, what it communicated, who it attracted. I said, David, if there's, if there's two to three things that I could do exceedingly well in this organization, you know, what two, three things would best serve my team that's entrusted to me first and foremost, would best serve the organization and of course my own career trajectory. And he said, well, there's two things. And he literally said this. He said, I want you to get so good at hiring people. I want you to be a connoisseur of talent like a sommelier understands the nuances of fine wine. Like, All right, that's a little, I'm a kid from Brooklyn. That's a little bit over my head, but it landed. And he said, once you do that, I want you to train them. I said, well, what's the third thing? to train them again, train them again, find the right team, bring them together. And he had a very clear idea on what the right team was and simultaneously what the right team was not. And he understood that once you have that team, continual training and development is a non-negotiable aspect of cultural development, which required leadership and coaching. Um, from there, from David Barton Jim, I went to work with your boss, Neil Spruce. Um, when I came on as the Director of Professional Development for the National Academy of Sports Medicine, Neil taught me the value of having a galvanizing mission, a vision, sort of like a battle cry. It, it was almost like you know, finding myself in, in, in a scene from Henry V. And Neil created for me, and, and this is going back, because I, I met Neil in my Gold's Gym days, so I'm skipping around a little bit. But what Neil taught me, what was kind of like what David Logan in his book, Tribal Leadership, is trying to impart, that within any society, and you'll recognize all of these levels, there are five levels of tribe that exist. But you really don't elicit high performance until you get to about a level four tribe, which is when you make the transition from me to we. And that we has such a strong sense of intention and purpose it's kind of like we are great, but they're doing the wrong thing. Kind of like the best thing that ever happened to Coke was Pepsi. The best thing that ever happened to Colgate was Crest. Now, as you take a look at current events, take it too far, that can be malignant. But in other circumstances, it can be galvanizing and it can create the type of collective momentum to start moving you towards the fulfillment of whatever vision that organization has for itself. From from NASM, I, I went into, oh God, motivational speaking. And that taught me that I didn't want to be a motivational speaker. That got <laughs> me out of my whole infatuation with quote unquote self-help. I mean, if it's self-help, what do you need me for anyway? Kind of defeats the whole purpose. So I'm a recovering motivational speaker now. Um, I worked with Tom Palmer. I worked with the Ursa Traveling Trade Show. Um, I did a lot of work with... Uh, couple of great guys, Bill Parisi, Martin Rooney, and we dealt more with smaller health club chains, not the big conglomerates like we were dealing with predominantly at NASM. And that was refreshing because one thing I loved about the small health club chains, and, and you know, the, the best example I've ever gotten from that was from an executive of a big, big health club chain. It was like, if you see an iceberg and you're a couple of miles out, a couple of kilometers out, and you're in a you're in a massive ship. You're like the Titanic. It's very hard to turn that thing around. Where the, the agility, the flexibility, the adaptability of a smaller chain is kind of like you're in a speedboat. And that was the analogy. And, and, and I love the creative tension and sometimes the chaos, but the the emotive infectiousness that you can generate 
and drive within that environment. Not saying you can't do it in a big health club chain. There's there's multiple examples of large health club chains that have traditionally done that exceedingly well. Virgin is one that pops into my head. Um, but it, it just just the nature of how that manifests and how you create that momentum in the smaller clubs was something that I connected with. Um, from there, you know, I went to work with uh, PTA, uh, PTA Global. We created this organization, uh, myself and the other co-founders, um, under the guidance and the generosity and vision, let's be fair, of Richard Boyd. And you know, for, at the second I got out of PTA Global, I went back into speaking and consulting. But one of the things I thought was very important to do was get back into the trenches. I, I have a, um, do I look more credible and intelligent now? Okay, maybe not. But one of the things that I believe in strongly is there's a difference between being the sage on the stage and speaking from, from authority versus being in the trenches. If you've never led a sales team, you can't teach sales. Um, if you've never led a team to effectively hit targets and overcome the inevitable challenges that get in the way, you can't step up on stage and teach leadership. And you know, there's a big difference between a coach or a trainer, training rooms of coaches and trainers, and you get a question, it's like, oh, well, let me go back three slides and find the answer versus, you know what? I was dealing with that exact situation yesterday in my hands-on practice. You have a different dynamic and there's a different level of honesty with that audience. And I thought that was critical. So I went back into personal training for a while. And I was, uh, so I was the head of education de facto for David Barton, Jim again, did clients, oh. did my speaking. And, you know, from there I became the, um, the di director of coaching for 24 hour fitness. Um, from there, uh, the director of coaching for IOM, which is a position I still hold. Um, we went and we consulted for the government of Singapore in creating a coaching, a coaching based culture for everybody to enhance resilience and innovation for their next big market. I don't know if people know this, but um, Singapore is operating. <coughs> they don't operate election to election. They operate on 100 year plan. So when they became fully independent in 1965 um, under the, the leadership of the, the late great Lee Kuan Yew, they were operating towards a vision of 2065. Now, obviously there's a lot of adaptation and, and, and maneuvering in achieving that, but every decade it is a pivotal point to, to see if they're hitting the metrics that they need to hit to get to that 100 year vision. The next big uh, marker for them is 2030. So I was really privileged to be part of that. And now I'm working with a company Viba as the director of, I think director of coaching is kind of like in my future, um, seems to be a consistent title. And I'm working with the San Diego school district and that's it. Excellent. Wow. That's, you know, what's really uh, refreshing here is I've never heard the, the full story from you, Bobby. And there have been literally as thousands of people that you've mentored or coached over the years. And to hear you speak of your mentors and the people who brought you you know, inspiration and 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 help guide your your path to your personal success uh, is really good to hear. And speaking of being around smart people, smarter than yourself, uh, Scott Pullen is on and he says hello. And uh, I'm definitely feeling out of place here. There's a lot of brilliance on this call. So thank you for sharing your background, Bobby. You know, if one you of want, the things that I want to screen and we can let Rodney Horn and Scott Pullen come on. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, now that I've gonna, like induced gonna... insomnia on my resume, um, <laughs> no, I've cured insomnia, not induced insomnia. Anyway, sorry. Well, Long... That'll have to be a project down the line. Um, one of the things, Bobby, that 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 we've asked every person, such as yourself, that helped make PTA Global exist, is a little bit about the past, present, and future. You've been in the industry, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, assume an age here, but a good 20, 25 years. And looking back to when you started at your first job or maybe the second job and what it took 
for coaches like yourself and others successful? What were those traits, those skills, those characteristics, education? What are those things that, that, that made that coach, that trainer successful that are still absolutely crucial today? What, what would you say would say be the, the top three things? That, that's, a, that's a brilliant question because there are some attributes that are absolutely timeless. And if I have your permission, I'd like to, to divide that from one position, one company culture to another, because they were, a they were kind of the same, but a little bit different. There were certain nuances. And at Gold's Gym, and I say this affectionately, the person who owned Gold's Gym probably changed the entire trajectory of my life. However, we didn't know exactly what we were doing. Um, and we didn't, we didn't pretend to, but we did exceedingly well under the circumstances based on a couple of core tenets of that organization. And that was, we weren't there to create services. We were there to generate experiences. Now there's a difference, you know, where you have goods and services and, and that's basically the manufacturing of something that's tangible, you know? So I need water, I need a product to put it in. This is, this is goods. Services are something that's delivered and it's intangible. So basically what you are selling is a promise that based on trust, you said that you would fulfill at some given point in the future in exchange for monetary compensation. What we were operating on is that experiences, this comes from Pine and Gilmore, experiences are as distinct from services as services are from goods experiences is a matter of what they're they're staged they're not manufactured they're not delivered they are staged as a matter of fact one of my greatest influences in my career was someone who had nothing to do with fitness it's mike nichols the legendary broadway and you know film director now he was the guy who you know he's, he's done a ton of work but most famously the graduate he he, he created dustin hoffman's career and it's that we didn't just hire we cast it for our facilities. And, and the second component of experiences are they are memorable, which means they have to be emotionally provocative. I first started creating E3 back over 20 years ago, working for Gold's Gym, because the emotional connection being the gateway to any type of forward progression or trajectory within that client's journey all begins on how do they feel? What feelings do you elicit? What feelings do you provoke? What feelings and resources do you withdraw? Not what you pin it, put in, but what do you draw out of that person? So when I went to Dave, uh, David Barton, Jim, we still had that fanaticism around experiences, but what we also had was around aptitude, coachability. You had to, when you were coming in there, you had to sign on to have continual training and development. It was weekly. Now I know we probably broke some HR laws and we could have never gotten away with that if we were in California, but it, it was, you had to have an, a never ending obsession with continual learning and development. And it doesn't matter what you brought to the team last week, what are you bringing today? And, and, and we worked off of effort as a purveyor to results. David has a thing called the perfect rep. Now, now we know, like, you know, if there's the neurophysiologist on this call, the biomechanist, we know there's no such thing as a perfect rep. It wasn't an actual thing. It was an ideology that if you were so single-mindedly focused on excellence and being 100% present for that person for the span of a single rep, that would be an amazing experience when those reps evolved into a set, when those sets evolved into a workout, when that workout evolved into the fulfillment of the objectives laid out by the program that fulfills the promise that you implicitly, maybe explicitly made the day you were hired. So that was the second thing on training and development. And the third thing is self-expression. We were looking for people that were a little bit weird because you don't get unbridled enthusiasm. You don't, 
the, the worst advice I ever got, I've got amazing advice from consultants. I've got horrible advice from consultants. And one of the worst pieces of advice I ever got was, you know, Bobby, we promoted you to management because basically you're an example of what our ideal trainer is. Well, that's a really bad reason to promote somebody to management because sometimes your best salesperson is a horrible sales manager. Your best trainer is a horrible fitness manager. There has to be, yeah. there has to be certain characteristics that are distinct. Not saying you can't have that trajectory, but a lot of times you engage in the Peter principle, which is when you find your best person and you keep promoting them until they hit their level of incompetence. Then you got to get rid of them and you lose a key a asset in your organization because, you know, like, like people are not everything that matters, but they literally are the only thing that truly matters. So it, it was that weird factor where somebody came to me and said, well, you want to find people just like yourself and you want to make clones of you. So you want me to engage a highly diversified audience and membership base that has different backgrounds, different fears, different expectations, different interpretations, and give them the most homogenous experience that we could possibly offer by having everybody just like everybody else. That does not work in the real world. And what David understood is I want you to find people a team of trainers, like in one facility, we would have like 60 trainers. And I want you to find the smartest people, the most impassioned, slightly weird people. And I want you to put them together. And in that, in, in that complete chaos, I want you to basically direct them towards an outcome. And that was beautiful. I think one of the reasons why director is always in my title because a lot of what I've learned about fitness and leadership came from the performing arts. And what a great director does in film is no different than what a great director does in fitness, which is you cast based on finding the very best people who are most suited to the production, to the experience, to what you want to bring to life. And then you don't, you don't tell them what to do. You extract it from them. You create the environment and you give them the resources so that they're at their most resourceful in eliciting the optimal performance, not individually, but collectively toward a common goal. What are you trying to bring to life? And that's what I learned from David Barton. And it's still relevant today. If you all have unbridled enthusiasm and a commitment to creating experiences, because human being, if you don't get to someone's heart, you cannot get inside their head. And if you have a high level of aptitude, a, a desire and a willingness to blow yourself up and reinvent yourself continually, and you've got something that's a little bit weird and distinct about you that you can express in the way nobody else can express, those three things will serve you extraordinarily well, no matter what trends emerge or dissipate within the fitness industry. Oh, I love it. Well, I've got the weird part covered, so that's good. Uh, a reminder to the listeners out there, if you have any questions for Bobby, now's your chance. Put them in that question panel and we'll make sure and, and get to those as we're finishing up here so that you have an opportunity to learn, you know, to learn exactly what it is that you signed on for, that you engaged with today. What are those things that you would like to know more about from Bobby? Now, Bobby, in, in, at, in our education, in the PTA Global Education, you covered a lot of topics um, from behavior, behavior change, motivational interviewing, building your business, marketing, all of that. But, but the thing that I think all trainers experience, I'm sure they do, that we all do, all coaches, is the challenge of quote unquote behavior change. So neck up fitness, right? Not training the body, but training the person, training the human being not just the human body, which you are have done so eloquently and, and help create for our uh, education and our, our listeners and learners. Here's the question, and I know it's very vague, but I know, but I, but I'm confident you're going to be able to, to make something great of it. Can we actually change behavior or can we, can we assist with behavior change and and what would your just general question like that i know i know that the next question is give me more detail dan i'm going to leave it there because i know you can take that apart and give us a great answer okay if you pushed me on that answer to a yes or no my answer would be no 
the only person, because I assume you're not talking about our behaviors, you're talking about client behaviors. Right. And the only person who can change the behavior of a client by sheer force of will is Professor Charles Xavier. So what if you're not a telepath? Then what do you do? Well, you can, you can encourage behavior change. You can create a safe, space of non-judgment to where somebody can step out in, in in the first few steps of their journey towards behavior change and i'll take it from motivational interview motivational interview and there are basically four things that you you're doing for someone you're helping them crystallize and identify what it is that they truly want not what they think they want or think they should want but getting crystal clear on what they want and how it supports the highest values that they have. Teleology, which is the study of meaning, drives behavior. And once you identify what that is, why they want that, you can help them create discrepancies between their current behaviors and the desired behaviors that would be congruent with the outcomes that they want. You can help them create micro-progressive wins, which elevate their sense of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is just my inward belief in my ability to initiate and then perpetuate behaviors that are in correspondence with a specific desired outcome in the future. You can hold a space of empathy where it's not about your values. It's not about your journey, your interpretations. It's not about your character where you can imaginably project yourself into the thoughts and feelings and situations and aspirations of the person in front of you. And then you can roll with resistance because resistance is not insubordination. It's not laziness. It's not lack of motivation. It's actually a critical element involved in the reconciliation of ambivalence. So a lot of times when somebody says they want one thing, but they're engaging in something that kind of gets in the way. It's a barrier. You know, I want to lose weight, but what I'm really doing is grabbing hog and you know, No disrespect. And, you know, I, I, I want, you know, a healthy marriage, but what I'm really doing is having an affair. In, in a lot of times, what you're witnessing is someone who has two very high values. They're very important but they're in direct conflict with one another. Like when I was a kid, you know, I, I really wanted a cat and a parakeet. Those two pets are in direct conflict with one another. No good can come out of that. And so part of reconciling ambivalence, which is trying to pursue two things that are in nature, in opposition, it, what starts to happen is you get in, in trying to reconcile how getting this isn't going to cost me something that I also value deeply, you start to get pushback. And it's not antagonistic. It is part of the change process. You know, for example, somebody could say, well, you know, I want to lose, I want to lose some weight. I want to lose a few kilograms. But what they really want is not to lose a few kilos. You know, and me and Pete Cohn talked about it in our book, Shut the Duck Up, where what, they re what they really want is to create intimacy in the marriage. And they've lost intimacy and they're going, oh, well, if I only lose that weight, I'll be more attractive to my partner. But as they start to lose the weight, they notice that maybe they are getting more attention from their partner. And now they, they start to resent their partner because the love and affection they're getting is conditional. So I will give you love and withhold love as long as you follow my rules and you're acceptable to me. Or they start to realize as I'm losing the weight, it's not making a difference in my marriage. So maybe my marriage is broken. And maybe when I was grow growing up, my parents got divorced and it, it, was, it almost destroyed our family. And I promised mom and dad that'll never happen to me. So now you have strong ambivalence and it's very easy to go, well, you don't want it bad enough. You're not, you're not willing to do the work. You're lazy. That's not the root cause. The root causes that conflict. So rolling with resistance rather than seeing it as insubordination is critical. So those four things and the tools that you can employ to bring about those four elements uh, of motivational interviewing, that's one perspective of how you can 
not create or facilitate, but support your client in changing their own behaviors. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, more brilliance from Bobby. Those of you tuning in, uh, the questions are coming in, which I absolutely love. Uh, and we're going to be getting to those real quick. Question for you, Bobby. Now, now you talked about the uh, the process and um, uh, uh, you know basically determining what what the person truly wants, what those barriers are, how they self sabotage, and and some of the the effects of uh, coming out of that or making those changes. That, as we know, influences the coach as well. And uh, coaches or trainers. A very common question and a very common challenge is coaches and trainers get frustrated because the 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 client or the patient um, is not applying or following suggestions um, and so forth. So they get frustrated with that client because they're not making the progress that either A, they want them to make or B, selfishly, they want to measure themselves by through their progress, whatever it may be. What advice do you have for the coach who becomes frustrated along the way? Well, the first, the first thing, and you alluded to this, Dan, you have to understand why are you being frustrated in the first place? What is your intention? Is it that if I cannot get this client to change, then somehow I'm not worthwhile as a trainer? So it becomes an ego issue. And I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that critically. You know, that you need you need certain balances of humility and ego. And, and if that's the answer, because it reflects poorly on me, I think the first thing is to kind of redefine what is it that you believe you do? And, and where we run into trouble, we semantics are everything. And we fail to clearly define scopes of practice and the roles that bring that scope to fruition. So it, a lot of times training and coaching are used synonymously. They are not the same thing. They're compatible. They're both highly valuable, but they're not equal. So that, that's one thing. What is it that's your scope and what do you expect from yourself? Um, I, I've, heard, I've heard the term, and this upsets people, uh, you are responsible for effort, but not outcome. And I agree with that. Because if you are responsible for outcome, every win is your win. It's not your client's win. And that does not build self-efficacy. And that likely generates resilience. And that, does, that removes self-accountability from the person. And what it also removes is capacity. Once you're gone from that scenario, they haven't learned how to produce those results on their own. So you got to redefine if you're running into that. What's my intention for other people? It, it might be like the late... Jim Rohn said, you know, you want it so badly for them. I used to want change for people. He said, I'm going to change them if it kills me. To which he quipped, I nearly died. Where <laughs> I think it comes from a good place with people. Where it, it, it's like, I care so much. It, it's almost like, like, Paul Check pops into my mind. You know, people used to come out of the Paul Check seminar and go, okay, that guy's intense. But when you build a friendship with Paul and, and you get to talk to him, this is my analogy for Paul. Paul was someone who, you know, was, was an expert lifeguard. And he's standing on the beach on duty one day. And he sees people swimming around. And behind him, he sees a fin. It's a shark. Now, he knows he can't get to you in time. And he's just trying to get everyone's attention, but they're oblivious. So what would you do in Paul's case? You would jump up and down. You would scream it. You would go mental. Not, not for your own benefit, you're really scared about the future, the, the, the very near future of that person who's swimming in closest proximity to the shark. Everyone's in danger, but especially that person. And, and that's kind of where I think a lot of trainers come from. It comes from a place of caring and deep concern. But the question is, is all of that, if you are working harder, in the transformation process, then your clients, are you being effective? And, and, and very often what you're generating is the exact resistance that you're looking to reconcile. So you gotta step back and use certain tools and say, what am I responsible for versus what are my clients responsible for? And there, there are ways to do it. 
you know, starting out with a vi with a clear vision. And a vision is not like, what do you want to achieve and what's your body? What do you want a day in the life to look like a year from now? And a lot of times it, it, it's kind of like, um, have you ever seen, have you ever seen Married with Children, the sitcom? I, yeah, of course. So if you've ever seen it, it was like the most distasteful, uh, <laughs> offensive comedy. I loved it. I don't know what that says about me. But Al Bundy, you know, it, it, he, he hates his life. He hates his wife. He hates his job. He hates his customers that buy shoes from him. Can't stand any of that. He, he's annoyed with his kids. The dog is frustrating. And the question is, if you were to sit down with Al and you were to ask Al Bundy what he wants his future to look like, he, he wouldn't be able to engage with you because that's so outside of his scope of imagination, given his dissatisfaction and how he interprets all of the disappointing experiences that have brought him to that point in his life. Now, whether that's true or false, it's an attitudinal issue versus, re doesn't matter. It's his reality. So where would you go with Al in order to create that future vision? You would go to his past. And you, you would try to like, Al, was there a time when you felt you were on the right track, when you felt inspired, when you felt confident, when you felt like you were exactly where you needed to be, doing what you needed to do, being who you most wanted to be? Now, where would he go? Four touchdowns in one game, poke high. That's where he <laughs> always goes. When he can't deal with the strain of the present, he goes to the past. Now, once you get that, you can start having a conversation. So what was it about those four touchdowns? What, what was the emotional state that that elicited? Now, let's go beyond emotions. What were the characteristics that, that allowed you to perform so well that you thought were important based on your value hierarchy? What are those values? Let's start to tease those values a little bit. If you died right after that game, what do you think they would have said about you at your at your funeral, at your obituary? How would you, who were you for other people in the stands? In what way would you inspire them? Now, what were the resources you used to get there? Like, you didn't just rock up onto a football field and crush it in a game. There had to be preparation and skill development. What were the resources? Who was around you? Who encouraged you? Who inspired you the most? And what were the internal strengths that you had that allowed you to, to, to not only do well in practice, but have the discipline, have the perseverance, have the single-minded focus to become that level of athlete. Now you have an archetype based on the past that's okay, well, you know, I know your future's screwed. I know your wife is horrible. I know your kids suck. I get this. But if they didn't, if that wasn't your current scenario, take it a look at all of the ingredients from poke high, what, which one of those would still be relevant a year from now? And, and, and what aspects of who you were back then would you like to recreate if you could tw six months, 12 months into the future? And then utilizing all of those same perspectives from the past, start to recreate what an ideal future would be. And a vision is what do you see yourself doing what does a day in the life look like for Al Bundy a year from now? So it's not, it's not, it, it's not metaphorical. It's not ethereal. It's not, a, you know, it's not a matter of, you know, I will be the greatest in my career. It, it's very day-to-day -day tangible. And then you can reverse engineer to today and start to talk about, well, what would, what would the poke high version of you need to do over the next six months to get there? What would he, he need to do over the next 30 days, over the next week? And what's what's one thing that you could do today? And, and sometimes you could brainstorm with your clients where this is where expertise and coaching merge. It's like, why don't we come up with, between the two of us, 10 ideas about one simple thing you could start to do today, one behavior that would move you in that direction, and then we could evaluate week by week. And you don't, you don't have to accept any of these. You could choose to ignore them. You could put them in a book, put them on a shelf and leave them for when you're ready. Or you could say, you know what, out of these 10 ideas, these three really speak to me. 
let's take a look at which one is most practical. And that's your choice. And you can do that. And, and, and when you go into a situation like that, a lot of times we as trainers, because we're so enthusiastic, we start to mistake change talk for sustained talk. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if I could get to the gym three days a week and, you know, work out an hour a day at this specific modality with this number of reps and sets and all that specificity that goes into setting a really strong behavioral goal, not what's going to, not the outcome, the actual behaviors that will produce that outcome. And it's like, oh, but my kid's schedule changes and, you know, I'm probably I have so much to juggle and we're like, oh, wow, you said three days at the gym. And we jump into solution too early where they're already bringing up the barriers to get there. Where if they said, so you know what? My kids, like they get out of school at different times, but you know what? If it, maybe I could hire someone who I really trust to go ahead and pick them up on days when they conflict with the gym. They're already building in their own solutions in their strategy. That is change talk. And a lot of times when you're getting sustained talk, because we have certain beliefs that if there's a problem, you want to focus on solutions. You know, 95% of your time should be focused on solutions, 5% on the problem. I'm going to say something blasphemous. 95% of your time should be focused on the problem, 5% on the solution. I know a lot of people, I just lost them. They just, they just had, a, had a mental explosion because that's so contrary to how we're trained to think as a trainer. But here's a few things. And, and, and if you've ever managed a team of trainers or if you've ever had a multi-club management experience, um, so yeah, Scott, I'm talking to you. Th this makes a lot of sense where we identify a problem. Let's say the problem is, here's a common one, that our, our first visit enrollments are down 3% from last quarter. So that means, you know, out of everybody who comes into the gym, 10 people walk into the gym, how many people make a buying decision today? That's our first visit enrollment ratio. And we say, well, the problem is low sales. So we need to, we need to jump into the solution, which is we need to train our salespeople to get better at closing and overcoming objections. But that wasn't, that wasn't the issue because you didn't stay with the problem long enough to realize it's that high pressure bully type of environment that's focused more on the needs of the salesperson and less on the situation of the person in front of you that's reducing that first vision enrollment ratio. So because you're speaking to symptoms, but you don't understand the root of the problem and you don't understand how that problem connects to the culture systemically, you're not engaging in systems thinking by solving that problem here, you're probably making it worse across the organization. That's number, that's number one. A second reason is because if I ran into a problem today and then by this afternoon I solved it, I would probably be the same person on the solution end of the problem that I was when I first encountered the problem. Where if I'm really examining the root cause of a problem, and, and, and it's, it, I'm sitting with it for a few weeks. I'm not going to be the same person. I'm going to have to evolve and expand my capacity by the time I generate a solution. So not only do I have a solution, but I've grown and my, and my capability to handle that level problem, encountering it in the future has also elevated. So stay, don't jump into solutions too quickly. And you might want to do what, what's not a motivational interviewing tool, but is often used in motivational interviewing, a decisional balance sheet, which is if I change or if I don't change, what, what are the pros, what are the cons? What, 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 what do I get as an advantage? What will I have to sacrifice? Because very often when people get stuck, it's because they're pursuing a verbal commitment. You know, I want to improve my cardiorespiratory endurance. I want to build a little bit of lean muscle at the sacrifice of a hidden commitment. Every time I go up and down in my results in the gym, you know, I get a lot more attention when I'm failing from my circle of friends because they're not fitness people and they encourage me. And every time I start doing better, they kind of get upset with me. 
So basically I'm pursuing attractiveness and confidence at the expense of love and belongingness and social safety. That's a problem. So you might need to sit there in the ambivalence a little bit longer and utilize things like a decisional balance sheet. Love it, love it. And that of course is available uh, in our behavior change and exercise course, our fast track, our certification course. Thank you for bringing that to us, Bobby. Uh, I wanna jump in to a few questions here so we can stay on time. Um, I had, there's also some comments. So I want to uh, make sure uh, Margarita, thank you Margarita, says blessings to you, Bobby. What an inspiration you are. Thank you for your passion and enthusiasm. I needed to hear this, life is beautiful. So thank you, Margarita. That was very, very, very nice. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah. Now, great, great question here. Uh, personal question, Bobby. And you opened with some, some pers uh, part of your personal story. How did the decision to become a trainer help you with your Tourette? You mentioned the, the Tourette's and you mentioned choosing the career, but how did it help? Okay. That is a very, intelligent question it's really <laughs> insightful a couple of ways what i know from when i first got diagnosed with tourette's i was lucky to run into two world famous neurologists that they're no longer with us but elaine and arthur shapiro who were pioneers in the diagnosis and treatment of tourette's and it, it's one of the major causes of Tourette's is a critical imbalance between dopamine and norepinephrine and, and all of the chain of events of consequences that come with that. And when Tourette's, the symptoms seem to subside when you're intensely focused. So you know, you, you'll, you'll hear about, you know, or they used to tell us to encourage us about athletes who had Tourette's. And when they were focused in the sport, they didn't seem to have any symptoms. But the second a game was over, all of their symptoms came back. And what fitness gave me the ability to do, especially fitness as a career, is look outside of myself. And, and rather than focusing on what I was struggling with and what my apprehension and anxiety um, and, and, and emotional pain, to be fair, dealing with Tourette's and other issues was, I didn't have any time for that or, or, or mental reserves because I was completely present with the person in front of me. Another major tenet of coaching is be present until you disappear. Listen until you disappear. And in that disappearing, so did the severity of symptoms of Tourette's. So when you're when, when I would get home, I would study intensely. I was obsessed. So I'm I'm kind of in remission. I still have a lot of symptoms with Tourette's, but it, it, you can't really tell as readily. Where if you would have met me at 20, I was the type of person where I'd be sitting in in um, a coffee shop or a restaurant and people would move because me just sitting there was disturbing. So I don't know if creating a, a career path that involved all of my attention and focus to the point of near obsession, which I think could be a good thing, it is responsible for my remission, but it, it most likely helped. I love that. that and you know, uh, a, a common theme there as you know, having spent as many years as you have in the industry at, at, at the level you're at is exercise. This is one example, Tourette's, but helps people overcome so many challenges in life, whether it's addiction or, um, you know, other health issues, exercises that seems to be the medicine in so many different ways. So that's a, that's a, a new one, um, a, a new an example I hadn't heard before, and I'm sure the listeners appreciate that. Uh, thank you. That was Mary who asked that, um, or no. And, yeah. of, and of course the movement itself. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Itself played a tr probably played a tremendous role in regulating dopamine and therefore norepinephrine is down the same conversion. So we have another question from somebody you might know. 
And it is so cool to that Annette Lang is on the call as well. I'm <laughs> telling you, you, you talk about oh, being man. surrounded by smart people. I'm definitely out of place here. And Annette's going to be joining us for an interview in August. So, uh, Annette, another That's contributor. So cool. Yeah, yeah I contributor. I've learned things. so much from Annette. <laughs> so she has a question, a great question. Uh, do you think it's necessary to keep up with all the technology, online, Instagram? presence to be successful is it is it necessary to keep up with all of that and and i think you and i are probably close to the same age and and i think we know exactly the question that she's asking what what how do you feel about that all right well let me give my disclaimer first because if you've been to my page on anything i am not very good at social media <laughs> i use social media as a way to just throw stuff out that I think will be helpful. I don't know if that's a factor of my age or I, I think I think one of my character flaws um, is linked to a character strength. It's linked to David Barton where he believed that once you identify what your critical success factors are and what you're really, really good at, double down on that. He's like, don't, don't do stuff that you're average at because then we're gonna to have to adjust your salary. We can find other people for that. <laughs> and I adapted that belief. And for a large portion of my career, it served me fairly well. But then when you start to evolve, like, like you know, social media is a tool, like the telephone is a tool. I was like, well, you know, would I be successful if I used the telephone or didn't use a telephone? I don't know, but it, it definitely would have hurt. And I, I think there's, this is personal. This is not my professional opinion because I don't think I'm really competent to answer this particular thing when it comes to tech and social media. But I, I think learning how to use contemporary tools in a way that keeps you current and expands your reach and allows for a more pervasive dialogue is a very good idea. And if you don't have that ability, it will hurt you. And I'm sure it's hurt my career I just, again, I don't care all that much because I like doing what I like doing. So don't, don't do what I do because that, I, I don't really think I have the right mindset in that area. But I, I, I think on the other hand, John Nesbitt back in 1985 wrote a book that was way ahead of its time. And he had the foresight to kind of predict the, the end of the information age and the birth of the communications age. And he had this one quote, high tech, high touch. And I think if you're utilizing technology as a replacement for emotive connection, it's going to fail. Like right now, you're watching me, your mirror neurons are not creating the same exact cascade of neurotransmitter and hormonal activity because it's asynchronistic with the most subtle facial expressions and body language and, and even tonality. So it's a great substitute in the midst of COVID, but it, it is not the same as touching a person. It's not the same as communicating face to face with a person. So, so and, and we could probably do three hours on what the differences are uh, practically and what the differences are scientifically, but it, there's, Technology will never be a replacement for high for high touch. And I, I think, you know, I've made mistakes where I said, well, I'm going to get really good at this one area in tech. And I spent a year trying to get good at something that I wasn't really suited to. And what I did conversely is I ignored things that I was very good at, that I should have been doing. And I know that's a very frustrating answer because I basically responded to Annette by saying, well, maybe yes and maybe no. And, and she's probably sitting there, but that, that's my honest response. Yes and no. Yeah. I, I don't have a, a clear, definitive answer to that. But thank you. For well, I, I, I've i mentioned this before on this series. Uh, when I first learned of PTA Global and was learning directly from Rodney, who's on the call, uh, I got a lot of answers like that. Depends, yes and no. Uh, I need to know more. And uh, that's that's a perfectly appropriate answer because there's so many directions we can go with it. Bobby, what you've I'd been like wonderful. Annette, in return, hold on. One, one thing I'd like to ask Annette is 
would she on her social media platforms put up the story that she told 2008 in Keystone, Colorado at Meeting the Minds about the client you had who smoked and loved cookies and how you dealt with that client and, and their journey, because that is one of the best stories on human behavior change I have ever heard. I have used that story. I've talked about Annette in, in so many situations, in boardrooms, in seminars, and I just think it's epic and it's beautiful. So, um, you know, Annette, maybe you can type in your contact information if somebody's looking you know, to collaborate with somebody or hire somebody to come speak in their facility, because that one story would be worth the price of admission. Annette's probably one of the best coaches I've ever met in my life. Oh, that's phenomenal. That's fantastic. And uh, AnnetteLang.com is how to get in touch with Annette. She messaged, I have that Meeting of the Minds DVD right behind me here. Uh, as, as uh, over the years, as I've purged through things of what do I need to keep and not keep, that's one that's not going anywhere. So I have that and I have that recording and I was just telling Annette about that. Great story, So fantastic, right? fantastic information, Bobby. Uh, now, uh, if people want to learn more from you or they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to find you, Bobby? Okay. Well, I just said I really suck at it, but I am on Facebook, you know, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I, I, I even go and, you know, check my messages like once every week on LinkedIn and I'm on, I'm on Instagram. So you can find me, you know, Bobby Capuccio, um, on any one of those forums. I'll never Excellent. be on Excellent. TikTok or Snapchat. So don't look for me there. <laughs> I don't know what that is. But... That makes two of us. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, listeners, thank you for tuning in. You will receive an email uh, after the webinar, about an hour, I believe, after the webinar uh, with more contact information as well as a, uh, special promotions from PTA Global. Please stay connected with us. Uh, tune in for future webinars. Uh, it's been such an honor to have Bobby here and uh, it's such a such a appreciation I have for all of your time and, and engaging with us uh, and so much appreciation I have for all of the co-founders and contributors who made this company possible, um, which I'm so passionate about. So a big thank you to Bobby. Thank you for your time, your expertise, sharing your experience, your knowledge. And do you have any parting words for our audience to uh, kind of close us down? No, no. I can imagine they're getting quite sick of me. So I'll just say thank <laughs> you so much. Really appreciate you hanging in with us and um, bye. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time. Stay tuned for more of these webinars with more brilliant people.